Convy had run their car off the bridge. He pulled Grace out of the sinking car, but left her father to drown. He could have saved him. There was time. He just chose not to. Instead, he took Grace back to New Orleans and collected his paycheck. Convy had run their car off the bridge. He pulled Grace out of the sinking car, but left her father to drown. Detective, am I glad to see you. Lock the door, will you? I don't think Dr. Gray would appreciate us snooping around. What's going on here? This feels so strange.
Have you found anything? What? Y yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen some things. Okay, let me know if there is anything you want to talk about. There's a book missing. What did you do? I was just rearranging the books. Well, come on, let's check it out. I think I'm beginning to understand. Dr. Gray is dealing with some kind of mass delusion. to finally meet you, Mr. Hartwood. I'm here on the behalf of your brother, Philip. You were expecting me, weren't you? Yes. You're from the Seattle, no? That's right. I just wanted to ask you a few questions to see if there is anything I can do to help you and your family. Okay. I understand you're full of imagination. You make up a lot of things. I suppose. And you obsess over them. Blurring reality and fiction. Sometimes. Do you want to tell me about the Dark Man? No. No, I, I don't. That's all right. Perhaps there is something else you can tell me. Something you know to be made up, but you hold dear. Juan? John? Who's John? No. Juan Luis Jorge. Wait there a moment. Here. Take a look. Is he... Oh, he is the author. It's a magnificent book. Life-changing, even. The real one is long dead, but I like to think of him as my, my friend. My most beloved friend. I see. Do you often do this? Fantasize about people you read about? No. No. Well, there is Jacob. Who is Jacob? Turn to the last page. Oh, it's a newspaper article. The Prisoner of Ice, Jacob Van Ostart. Is he also your beloved friend? Oh, no, Doctor. Not at all. He is the fire that fights fire. Yes, I think it's clear your overstimulated imagination, this mania, needs to be tempered for you to live a normal life. I know your family calls it the Hartwood Curse, but I want you to know that there is nothing supernatural about your condition. It's all inside your head. And with that, I'm very qualified to deal with. In time, you will be cured. In time, in time. Yes, in time we will exercise all your demons, all the dark men. Yeah! Please, Mr. Hartwood, calm yourself. What happened? Oh, don't you worry your little head about it, Miss Hartwood. Your uncle and I just had our first breakthrough. That mark on the floor looks like talisman positions, but from which direction should I look at it? The Snake Dagger, a monograph by Yael Klein. In Ludwig Prinz's book on pagan rituals called The Mystery of the Grave, as translated by Nicholas Vahi, there are several references to a sacrificial dagger called the Snake Dagger. It has long been thought of as a poor translation of the original text, that it would be more appropriate with worm dagger from the Latin vermis cultrum. This seems natural following the recent consensus that the original title of Prince's book 
the Vermis Mysteris should literally translate to the mystery of the worm. However, this would take away from Vahi's great effort at translating the underlying meaning of the words and revealing several cultural beliefs. While Prin certainly was using the term worm as a symbol or synecdoche for death and the dead, which is made clear by the contents of the book, in the case of the dagger, we shouldn't be too hasty to dismiss his translation. Reading through Vahi's correspondence with his patron, it appears that he had more than just the Latin text at his disposal. Vahi had dug up Prin's living relatives and uncovered several cross-referenced historical texts and an actual snake dagger. The dagger was dated to the early Middle Kingdom of Egypt and had such a clear shape of a wave that Vahi considered calling it the sinusoidal blade. Knowing the full story, it seems prudent that he chose to translate it as snake and not worm. There are several reasons why this choice of word helps us understand the pagans that Prin's book attempts to describe. The symbolic value of the shape becomes more apparent when reading about the use for the dagger. In the passage of possession and exorcism, we find the snake dagger poisons the poisoner within the victim and is therefore pacified. Where the literal text would tell us that the worm dagger trumps the demon possessing the victim, it tells us nothing of their reasoning. Only that somehow this dagger wins against the demon, like it had the better hand in poker. Vahi's translation allows us to follow the underlying logic to the ritual magic that is being performed. Poison the poisoner. Sounds like fighting fire with fire. That to hurt the demon possessing its victim, the priests would have to fight back with a power that is known to the evil they are fighting. The snake dagger is therefore not only a good way to describe its form, but it also helps us understand how it could be thought of as a useful tool for exorcism. Finally, it also helps us understand their relationship to lunacy, that it was thought of as something poisoning the mind rather than controlling it. What is also interesting to note is that the possessed are always considered poisoned in their head and not their heart. The snake dagger always went to the eye of the possessed, leaving them partially blind, if they had the good luck to survive. What were you saying about mass delusion? Dorsetto seems to have a deranging effect on people living close by. It has a history of creating cults devoted to some nature goddess. Even the name Dorsetto refers to the cult existing here before the Civil War. Dorsetto was the name of an ancient fertility goddess worshipped in Syria. Dr. Gray and his friends, however, seem to prefer... the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, or Shubnigroth. And that name can only have come from my uncle's twisted mind. Has that been there this whole time?
the dead have gone me. Who is this? Jeremy? Jeremy is with the dark man. You can't save him. Well, I've done everything he wanted so far, and there's just one more thing on the list. I expect him to keep his promise and return Jeremy unharmed. Get out, detective. While you still can. You think all of them are in this cult business? Even Jeremy? I'm not sure any of them have a choice at this point. We just need to find a way to stop all of this. Detective Conby wanted nothing more than to make sense of it all. But clearly, that was not in the cards right now. Detective Conby felt removed from himself. Like driving drunk, he carefully tried to navigate his environment. What the hell was going on? Was he finally losing his mind? At least Emily was here to call the police if he went off the deep end. You okay? You look a little frazzled. Just 
Stupid telephone. I know. I tried calling the police earlier. The telephone is completely dead. It's not... Yeah, no, the telephone isn't working. Miss Hartwood, I think you're gonna want to see this. Is there something in the closet? Yeah, there is. You don't see the very obvious gate leading to whatever Jeremy's madness is serving up next? I don't understand. Are you making some kind of fashion metaphor? I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Can you just tell me what you're doing? You don't see this. It's fine. It's fine. Catch you later. Are you going inside the closet? Yeah. You got a problem with that? No. Do what you think is right, detective. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Goodbye, Miss Hartwood. Disheartened by his failure to make Detective Comby was worried Emily could tell that she could see the madness written on his face. But what if he was the only one seeing the truth? Could that still be the case? If only he could find evidence that would make her understand that he had seen beyond the veil, or at least something that would show her he was worth the money she was paying him. Disheartened by his failure to make Emily understand what he was doing, Detective Conby actually felt better seeing the frozen hell before him. There was a finality to it. Its clear symbolic opposite to the dark man's desert made him realize this was the end. Soon it would all be over.